something. Let's get into sugar a little bit now. I don't want to spend too much time here, but it is interesting that sort of there's been this war between processed sugar, and I'm saying that intentionally, and, and fat for a long time. And when I wrote the carnivore code, I looked at literature that said that fructose was harmful for humans. And I thought, okay, sugar is bad for humans because sugar is sucrose and sucrose is a disaccharide and that contains glucose and fructose. And that looks to be bad for humans. I mean, there's a pretty decent amount of evidence in humans that fructose in the form of processed sugars or high fructose corn syrup doesn't look to be great for us. Now, for me, it was a pretty interesting and eye-opening experience to have issues on a carnivore diet myself that were related to long-term ketosis and electrolyte issues, and then add sugar-containing foods into my diet, fruit and honey, which I would call whole food sources of sugar, and um, to see my labs improve in many ways. My fasting insulin stayed low, my fasting blood sugar went down, my A1C went down, my muscle cramps went away, my testosterone went up, my sleep got better. And at the same time, I was kind of looking at the research and I didn't really believe the research when I first saw it because it sounds kind of hand wavy or, or it sounds like voodoo. But I, I think that there's something, my perspective, and you may disagree with me on this and we can talk about it. When I look at the research on fruit and there's an interesting amount of research on fruit and even fruit juice in humans, they appear to be unequivocally beneficial. Um, I know that even the likes of Robert Lustig have argued that fruit may not be bad for humans because it contains fiber, and that may mitigate some of the absorption of fructose. But when I, when I go further, and I just released a couple of weeks ago a podcast on fruit juice, and so I looked at all the research I could find on fruit juice, you know, watermelon juice, pomegranate juice, cherry juice, grape juice, orange juice. All of these have minuscule amounts of fiber, and they seem to be pretty beneficial for humans with, with outcomes that show decreased oxidized LDL in vitro, which is really the only way to study oxidation of LDL, improved endothelial function, um, decreased products of oxidation in humans, decreased inflammatory markers, certain prostaglandins. Um, the list kind of goes on and on. And I was kind of like, I was kind of wide eyed thinking like, okay, um, even fruit juice looks to be beneficial to humans in so many ways. And I'm happy to share the studies. I think we can put the studies on the screen and the YouTube corroborating all of that. I mean, I'll, I'll say this and then I'll, I'll be curious for your response. Watermelon juice is so interesting to me specifically because there are multiple studies in which they give people glucose. So they'll do an oral glucose tolerance test, an OGTT, and they'll infuse glucose and make people hyperglycemic, essentially with a quote unquote processed sugar. Um, and, and you see micro and macrovascular dysfunction of the endothelium when you do that. But when you give people watermelon juice along with an OGTT, it attenuates all of the negative effects of the OGTT in turn at the level of the endothelium. So it's really interesting mm -hmm. that like, I mean, I think you could even make an argument that fruit juice is even like an antidote to processed sugar. I, I don't think processed mm. sugar is good for humans, but I wonder, I mean, do you think it's possible that, that we are conflating research with processed sugar and high fructose corn syrup with, with fruit and saying that fruit or fruit juice is bad for humans based on research done with processed sugars, which don't really behave the same way in the human body? Or do you think I'm off base with that, that premise? No, no, no. I, I think, I think that I, I sort of, I'm sort of somewhere in the middle. You know, I, I do agree with you that, that, that is certainly different than processed sugar and, and straight sugar on its own, hundred percent. And, and, you know, high fructose corn syrup and sucrose and all that sort of stuff. Um, I think that there are certainly added benefits to even fruit juice. I think the fiber, you know, as, as Lustig said, probably does confer a benefit. You know, you, as he speaks about in his book, Metabolical, you it, eating um, uh, soluble and insoluble fibers sort of make a bit of a lattice structure and that blocks about 30% of the absorption in, in your intestines. So if you're eating things that aren't really good for you, I think fiber is a great idea. 
you know, but if you're not eating things that, that aren't good for you, then you probably don't want that because that's going to cause malabsorption. So that can be a benefit if you're, you're and, that, and that's some of the things too. Some of the studies looking at fiber being a benefit, they talk about how this stabilizes blood sugar. I'm like, well, if you're absorbing 30% less sugar, then obviously your blood sugar is going to be improved from that, from that standpoint. Uh, as far as fruit is concerned, I was talking to, to Dr. Gary Fetke about this actually, and, and he was saying that there was actually a lot of things in fruit, you know, vitamin C and other sorts of, you know, vitamins and minerals, which actually mitigate the effects of fructose in the body. And he's done, and he's he's very much against fructose in general. He's, he's very very against sugar, um, and uh, and but he he says himself that it, uh, when he's looked into the literature and he's looked into things that there absolutely are things in fruits that mitigate that effect of fructose. So I, I definitely agree with that. Um, the one thing is though, is, you know, sometimes, you know, with, with studies on, on juice or whatever, I always sort of wonder, okay, are they adding juice into, you know, processed food diet or you know, how are they, how are they managing that? Is that conferring a benefit to people that are eating, you know, largely a junk diet? Is that going to, are you going to get, see this, see the same benefits on someone like you or I, who are eating quite a lot of meat? Is that going to, is that going to give the same benefit? You know, so you know, seeing if that's translatable to, to our populations. Um, I mean, there've been studies in mice uh, done by Coca-Cola that showed that, oh, well, you know, sucrose and you know, natural cane sugar is actually really good for you. And you lose weight if you're giving, giving these mice a whole bunch of Coca-Cola. And it's just like, okay, um, I've got, I'm going to have problems with, <laughs> with a Coca-Cola doing a study saying that Coca-Cola is, is beneficial for weight loss. Um, so, you know, that could be, that could be something too, you know, depending on who's doing the study for fruit. Um, the main thing that I have of issue with fructose is I've, I've seen a lot of, you know, Lustig's work as well, and I've, I've found it to be pretty compelling. And then, you know, like you say, you know, if you find that you're, you're having benefit in your life and you're eating a certain way, I, th I think that people should definitely do that. And if you found that you, you've improved in a lot of ways, you should definitely do that. I haven't had those same issues. I haven't found that my, you know, I actually just did a, a set of uh, blood sort of coming up on six years and um, I haven't seen them yet because I'm, I'm on vacation, but my colleague at the practice, he got them and he just said, Hey, you know, I see that you ordered some bloods on yourself. And I was like, yeah, how do they look? He's like, yeah, everything's looking great. So I haven't gone through those yet, but according to him, everything's looking good. And my bloods three years ago were all in very good ranges as well. And so I didn't have issues with my hormones. Uh, well, no, I, I don't even use salt anymore at all. And uh, I don't get oh, cramps. That's interesting. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've, I've spoken to a number of long-term carnivores, you know, people in like zero carb health and zero your own health Facebook groups. They've been doing this for, I think some of them around 20 years now. And, and that old guard of people are saying that, yeah, you actually don't want salt. It can actually be addictive and cause you to overeat just like, you know, processed sugar could. I haven't really looked too closely into that, but from my own taste perspective, I've always told people just salt to taste, you know, and your, your body can tell you. And I've just naturally just wanted a bit less and a bit less salt. And now I, I just sort of prefer the taste without salt, even a little bit of salt, just say it tastes a bit too salty for me. So I'm still going by taste. I'm still just salting to taste. I'm not avoiding it. I'm just, you know, I don't feel I, I really need it. I just, I like the taste of the salt. So I did a, I did a, um, a podcast video talking about, you know, is, is ketosis harmful? There's a guy named Georgie Dinkoff who went on with Dr. McCall and they talked about the different you know, problems with being in ketosis long-term. And so, you know, I went through some of the literature as well with a guy named Richard Smith. And you know, we found other studies that sort of had, had uh, sort of a countering view. One that looked at people in ketosis for two years, for 24 months, and they found that their cortisol actually stayed the same. Their thyroid function stayed the same. And other markers uh, were either improved or stayed the same. And at least for me, I've, I've noticed that, you know, I feel perfectly good doing what I'm doing. And so I don't need to add that in. Um, I have seen people, especially with people that have been carb addicted, sugar addicted, when they start eating, uh, you know, fruit and honey, that that can trigger those sorts of that, that sort of addictive compulsion that they've had previously in their eating and they can sort of go down a bad path and some of them start eating a bit more fruit a bit more honey and a lot more honey and a lot more fruit and then they start slipping into all the processed garbage and i've spoken to you know one gentleman i spoke to a while ago 
he said that it, it started with that and it just started getting more and more fruit and honey. And then he was, you know, six months later, he was back to drinking soda and eating pizza on the couch. And he had sort of lost all the ground that he had gained. And so I'm, I'm very, I, I'm, I'm 100% in your, in your camp as far as people should self-experiment and do what feels right for them. And, uh, and I encourage people to just eat more meat. And that's what I want them to do. I don't think everyone has to do exactly what I do. Through self-experimentation and, and my reading of the literature, I think that just eating fatty meat is what's best for me. And I've noticed that in my body as well. And I just want to encourage people to try different things, open their mind, like you say, and, and try to experiment with themselves and just not be afraid of fat, not be afraid of meat. And if they want to eat vegetables, fine. But I don't think that people should be eating vegetables because they think they have to. They want to, and they feel that that's benefiting them go for it. But, you know, I don't want people eating that sort of stuff because they feel they have to, because I don't feel that they have to. And so just trying to educate them that way. But if they, if they want to, I, I know a lot of people that include fruits and vegetables or, or yeah, even fruits and vegetables, but you know, fruit and honey and things like that. And that's fine if that's what they want to do. I get a bit concerned when people have had serious carb addictions, serious weight issues, um, reincorporating that sort of thing, because I've, I've seen them slip down uh, and get quite addicted to carbs again and, and really uh you know lose all the ground that they've gained um i think that you know having been myself basically in ketosis for a long time and now you know have i been in ketosis all the time? i don't know i haven't checked my ketones i have no idea that's you what know? i was gonna I, ask I, you I check my HDL. yeah you know i see yeah so i don't i don't check my ketones and, and things like that all the time i i go by first principles you know i, I think that this is really how we evolved to eat if you think about you know, the Inuit or people during an ice age, they really didn't have anything else except meat to eat anyway. And so they had to live generation after generation after generation just eating meat predominantly. You know, maybe they had some other stuff as well, but it's hard to Orions. find. Oh you know, yeah, well yeah, hundred percent. You know, and and you know they would have, but but animals, you know, and Animal you know, when foods, you're in yeah. The, yeah, when you're in the Arctic Circle or you're in the North during an ice age really not much else to eat and so you know just being in that state of ketosis i think there's i think that that eating meat is our natural state and i think that you know we see this uh in in different populations where they're living generationally and i've been just eating meat for six years and five years in my early 20s and i didn't run into any of these problems so i i that you know, lends me to think, well, maybe there's something else, maybe something else that, that you and I are doing differently that have affected us differently. Um, because I haven't had that, uh, that issue. One point that, that some people make like, uh, um, you know, Bart K is that, you know, if you eat a large bowl, I, I, I don't know, know who that bowl, is, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I know, and, and, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I, I, sorry that he, uh, you know, gets a bit vitriolic in his, um, in his videos, but, one thing that one thing that he did say was that if you're eating a large bolus of protein, that that could transiently raise your your insulin levels and kick you out of ketosis, and uh, and that that could be very beneficial. It could be. I mean, again, I've never checked my ketones or my blood sugar, HbA1c. Yes, I've checked that, and that's always that's always been good. But I just let my body do what it's supposed to do. If I'm eating a big, and I generally do do that, I generally eat a, just a one big massive meal a day, and that's what. I feel best doing. And, you know, if I'm in ketosis that whole time or I'm in and out of ketosis, I'm happy with that. I don't, I don't really mind. I just trust in my body. I'm giving my body the inputs that it needs and it's going to do what it needs with that. Yeah. A couple of points on that. Um, so, you know, the Inuit are almost never in ketosis. There's actually research looking at mm -hmm. the Inuit and they're not in ketosis. And then interestingly, so there's a couple of papers that I was looking at and I'll quote from the papers, they say that traditional Inuit diets derive approximately 50% of their calories from fat, 30 to 35 from protein, and 15 to 20% of their calories from carbohydrates. I'll put the study up on the screen for people if they're watching on YouTube, and I'll quote it. 15 to 20% of the calories are carbohydrates in the form of glycogen from the raw meat. Um, and that's been, that's been shown like multiple times that uh, significant amounts of carbohydrates are found in raw meat and raw liver, especially when they're eaten fresh and uh, by the Inuit. So it's interesting to think that I think the Inuit, many people in the Inuit communities who are in those sort of extreme environments also possess polymorphisms that sort of prevent them from going into ketosis. 
This is kind of an interesting thing. But the Inuit are not in ketosis very much at all. And I think that if you're eating a lot of raw meat, you're getting a lot of carbohydrates in that. So I wonder for you, if you're, if you're in ketosis very often, um, and I also yeah. wonder if some people deal with ketosis differently than other people. For me, I was checking my ketones pretty regularly and I was, my ketones were anywhere from 0.8 millimolar to 1.5 millimolar. So most people would say I was in ketosis and my electrolyte issues were profound. Um, and I've, I, I guess not everyone gets these issues, but I have seen and worked with, with a lot of people who have developed profound electrolyte issues on long-term ketosis. And so it's interesting. When I looked at my labs, my testosterone was going down. My T3 was really low. My T4 was sort of normal, but I might look at my reverse T3 was going up. So there's, I mean, it, it's interesting because if you look at the evidence, it's kind of mixed. There's definitely evidence, and I can show the study, that if you look at obese men, when you put them in ketosis, the cortisol metabolism changes pretty significantly, and meaning that they the 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type one goes up, meaning that they don't, they don't really, they make more cortisol and they recycle less cortisol. So they're just, the cortisol metabolism is changing at least acutely. And I believe that study, let me check. I have it pulled up here. I believe that study was, uh, multiple weeks in length, um, in terms of, uh, how long they were looking at these people. This was a four-week ad libitum, high-fat, low-carb versus uh, four-week ad libitum. I'll show the study, actually, so you can see it. It's interesting to me that the cortisol metabolism changes over the course of four weeks. Now, you see here in obese men, um, cortisol regeneration increased and reduces cortisol inactivation by A-ring reductases in the liver when they do this low-fat, high-carb. And this is 4% carbohydrates. So... When I look at the literature, I see I see studies like this that say, hmm, like there there are there is some evidence that at least in some people, long term ketosis can negatively affect. Well, I would say moderate term ketosis, four weeks of ketosis, at least in that study, anything over a day, perhaps we would consider long term, um, can affect cortisol metabolism negatively, can affect thyroid hormones, can affect all sorts of things. And then on the flip side, if you look at athletes, I mean, this is research that I'm sure that you're familiar with. Athletes on higher carbohydrate diets have improved free testosterone to cortisol ratios after bouts of intense exercise. And they have improved metrics of immune function after intense exercise when they include carbohydrates in their diet. So I guess I'm just, I'm just not sure that, that ketosis is benign for all humans all the time. And I think that your point is well taken yeah. around the food addiction. I haven't really figured out how to navigate that for people yet. I think that's a small number of people, but it's a very valid point that for some people, not including carbohydrates in any form, may be what they need to do while they're recovering from some sort of psychological food addiction because it can trigger them. But I also want people to know that if they're not including carbohydrates, and I hear this all the time, and they're having issues with muscle cramps or sleep or any of these sorts of problems or thyroid or being cold, um, that, that including carbohydrates, even in the form of fruit juice and fruit and honey, at least from my perspective, is something that's both evolutionarily consistent and, and pretty benign for most humans. Now, maybe there's a few different case studies in there with, uh, with people with food addiction. And certainly there are benefits to ketosis in people with profound neurological disease. Um, but uh, I think that, mm. I think that I've, I've found it important in my work to let people know that it's okay to reincorporate carbohydrates if they're not doing well on only meat. And then we can talk about organs in a moment.